Welcome to Two Wizards at a Mic! I did the introduction last time, so now it's Andrew's turn. Andrew, <laughs> introduce the show. Yes, I am Andrew, and uh, we're going to talk about D&D, our love. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about how you can get started in D&D, whether you want to spend zero dollars or more than that. And we'll talk about the basics of getting started. And uh, I'm going to do a little quick update for Kwood Publishing at the beginning here. We now have a proof of the new book. So we have our first three books, Feyland, Underworld, and City. And today, the fourth book arrived in the mail. Oh, nice. So this is Monsters of the Wilderness, Oswald's Curse. 120 new monsters for the game and uh, the fourth book in the series and hopefully that goes to kickstarter backers when we get all the books shipped here <clears throat> at the end of um next month and, and then, then you're gonna be like jamming stuff into boxes for like two months <laughs> yeah for about a month yeah so um <clears throat> hopefully those start going out next month probably late march and then they'll be released to the public on drive through and that version also arrived um for me to look at today as well. Oh, cool! So yeah, things are moving along. And meanwhile, I'm right. I'm working on the fifth book in that series, um, and that should be kickstarted in April or May. Does that one have a title yet? Did you tell me, and I've just forgotten? No, it's, no title. Shh. It's a secret. We yes. won't talk about it at all. <laughs> well, we have dropped a few little hints, but uh, yeah, we'll keep it under wraps for now. The cover's not done yet, so. We need the cover first. Excellent, excellent. So, so tell me, what is the first thing you always recommend to somebody when they want to get into the game? What's kind of the, what's your sort of default? Like, oh, well, you should pick up this or you should do this or. Yeah, good question. So there's a very simple way to start, um, which costs, as I said, nothing to start because the D&D site um, if you just Google that, they have free uh, basic rules that anybody can download. And those basic rules have the rules, um, the classes, the races of the creatures and your characters. And they've got a few monsters and um, a few magic items even. And it's a good place to start if, um, if you want to check it out, if you want to check the game out. There's also a couple of starter kits that have been put out. Now these in Canada, the, the starter kits are about $25. Uh, the States usually around $20. So the first one that came out for fifth edition was called the starter kit. And uh, it basically just has the basic rules and adventure and the, and dice. Um, the dice aren't the greatest quality. The adventure is okay. Um, and again, like I said, the basic rules you can actually buy, you can get for free. So the starter kit, it's just, it's a little bit, it's convenient having the dice there and an adventure to start. So it's a nice option. Um, the new starter kit called the essentials kit is this guy. So yeah, this which comes I actually with picked more. up a while ago. Yeah. Oh yeah. So it comes with a bit more. So it has the basic rules again. It has um, dice. It has rules. If you would just want to play one on one with the DM, if you just want to have one player and one dungeon master, um, it has a map. It has a it has a little pretty flimsy DM screen, but it's perfect if you want to if you if you're traveling or if you want to play, um, you know, maybe in the pub or something. Um, it's a really convenient thing to have. It's not a long lasting DM screen. There's also a bunch of cards in there for conditions and for NPCs and uh, magic items. And those are the kind of things that I was talking about last week, which seemed like a good idea, but in practical terms, I bet you 90% of people who buy this kit will never use them. Because again, the Dungeon Master, you don't need more stuff. And um, wow. people usually, I'd say these days, don't play as long as they used to back um, when we started in the 70s and 80s, games aren't as long. Um, 
And that's one of the reasons you don't need as much stuff, I, I think, or you know, it's not as practical to have it around. So those are some really simple ways to start. The two starter kits are pretty good, um, not too expensive, convenient to have dice and the, uh, the adventure there. Uh, and you said you you looked at the essentials kit, I think. Yeah, I actually uh, probably actually around this time last year, mm. um, I was I just happened to be wandering through a you know our, my local bookstore, and they had one on the shelf, and I'm like, you know what, I I I don't need this, but I actually got it because I wanted to uh, share it with my sister and a couple of my friends who. You know, I played D&D with years ago, but really wanted them to kind of reinvestigate it and, and whatnot to try. And because, you know, at, the, at that point we were all online and, and everything was happening online. So I thought it would be kind of something cool to do. Um, but, yeah, I was actually surprised what resources there were that were in the box because it, it sort of harkened back to the days for me of, of my original red box, you know, back in whatever. But, yeah, it was actually very cool. So I was able to, to you know, show it to them and, and say, you know, you should... Uh, you know, check this out. Uh, there's also and that link I put on the screen is actually the the one I sent to them. Uh, just go to the base basic rules. It kind of goes through how to start a character, how to start you know thinking about how you play the game again, and those kinds of things. And yeah, I was I was I'm impressed to be honest. I mean, I'm Ooh. those other branded ones where they have like uh, Rick and Morty and a couple of other branded ones. I was not impressed with those. But the basic ones, like the essentials kit and whatnot, just it's and and they're not overly expensive. They're actually really really affordable. So, but yeah, as for being able to play, yeah, I mean, if you have an internet connection, you can find everything you need. The only thing I would suspect, well, actually, you could probably use digital dice. I guess is I've seen tons of locations online to have you know virtual dice and stuff like that. So in theory, I guess you don't even need dice. So. It's an option. Yeah, yeah, that's that's one option for sure. Um, yeah, it's a good point to look back at those old box sets from basic D&D &D and expert. And um, I guess that's one thing we've done in 30 or 40 years that we've got dice that we don't have to use crayons on anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and I have talked about that before, about how you yeah. know, the, the stats, the, I guess it's wax. It's so dried out, it just falls apart and you have to like almost jam it in with your palm. To, I need to know what the number one is going to look like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, those kinds of things are always useful because uh, I mean, I, I actually found, I don't know, last year, the year before I actually found a website where you can print out dice. And basically all you need to do is you print it out and then you tape it together or glue it together. And then you have these large ish dice that you can uh, utilize, which again, uh, not that inex you know it's it's kind of inexpensive to do that annoying but you know it's still doable but uh but yeah i mean you've got all of these different things that you can access nowadays i mean you when you and i started like holy cow like getting resources for D, D was like i will now pray to some god and it will come down and <laughs> give me some dice <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it wasn't like it is now, where you can order. A lot of people have the ability to order these um, games, and yeah, and a lot more is available for sure. So, other than the starter kits and the option of getting it all for free on the with the basic rules, another way you can start is with the core books. So, the one core book you really have to have if you're going to use if you're going to use those books is the player's handbook, because that has the rules. The, the races, the character classes, and um, most of it, a lot of it actually is spells for the spellcasters. And there's a few creatures in the back for druids too. So um, that's one book you really have to have if you're going to go the way of using the core books. Um, and players need them, and uh, the dungeon master could use it to run the game very easily. Um, the next book I would say would be the monster manual because you right. want to have interesting creatures and characters in your story. And um, another option is to get uh, monster manuals from other companies. So there's been, there are actually not a lot of them. And uh, we are one of the companies that's made a few. So again, there's Feyland is the first book and Underworld, 
the second book. And then the third book, the city book. And then I showed you earlier, Monsters of the Wilderness. So those monster books um, are another option. The Dungeon Master's Guide, I wouldn't say that you have to have this to run the game or to play the game. The real bonus about that book are the collection of magic items and treasure, which is a fairly big part of the game. And that is yeah. all contained in there. The other rules and information, I'd say the original Dungeon Master's Guide for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, first edition, I'd say that DM's Guide is probably better overall. It has more information, more detail. Um, the, the current one is, is, it's a decent book. It's pretty useful. And um, like I said, the best part is the magic items and treasure section. So looking just quickly at those prices, so the core books, um, the Player's Handbook, Monster Manual, Dungeon Master's Guide from D&D, those in Canada are about 50 or 60 bucks still. Um, 50 or $60 in the States goes down to 30 or $40 American. Yeah. And um, then our... Um, books that monster series i showed you our pdfs are around ten dollars american our soft covers around 20 to 25 and our hard covers around 30 to 35 american so um those are some options if you're going to use the core books um hardcover books for your game yeah i was going to say that the um I actually, when I, every time I've ever bought any books, I generally go to um, buying them from uh, local bookstores mm -hmm. uh, because I tend to like to support them. But I have to admit that the, and the bookstores complain about this, at least the ones that I've talked to, um, about the cost of some of these books where they are, you know, 50, 60 bucks. But uh, they're not allowed to discount them as mm -hmm. much as they could because yeah. of the rules for the contracts for the publishing and all that kind of stuff. Yet, if you turn around and go to Amazon, they're significantly discounted there quite often. Not all the time, but if you pay attention, you'll actually be able to catch them at almost half the usual, you know, sticker price. But, um, but the, um, but every time I have bought them, every time, like for every edition that I've bought books for, I always do player's manual, monster manual and DM's guide, just exactly the way that you described it. Because the first the first one, if you don't have that one, you could be completely lost and mm -hmm. it would be kind of a nightmare. But um, but for books like for companion, not companion, um, uh, for books that, that add things, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Not companion, but companion books, but essentially resource mm -hmm. other resources that they've published, um, like the wilder, uh, the wilder guides and all those sorts of things. Are, are those kind of important, do you think? Like, are those... I have some of my own, but I don't have... I don't think I have all of them. But what do you... What do you sort of... Your attitude about those? Yeah, I think um, if you find a use for them... Um, in the original Dungeons & Dragons with Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, there was uh, the Wilderness Guide, the Dungeoneer's Guide, Unearthed Arcana, which really expanded the game quite a bit. Um, yeah. There are books like those. So 5th edition, you've got uh, Xanathar's, and um, Volo's Guide to Monsters, Mordenkainen's um, Tome of Foes, and the new one's Tasha's Cauldron. So those books are, I'd say some of them, it depends what, you, what kind of game you want to have, depends um, where, like for example, if you're playing in the Forgotten Realms, which is the most, I guess overall, it's the most popular series and there's more resources to play in that setting then the Sword Coast Adventure Guide might be useful. If you want to add more monsters, like I said before, then um, Volos actually has some interesting elements. It has a, it does a deep dive into a few of the creatures like um, Beholders and uh, Giants. And um, so, you know, a really, really good deep dive it gives you lots of uh, detail and lore and things you could add to your game. So it depends what you want to do, what kind of game you want to have. I'd say overall the Xanathar's one, I'd say, is by far the best because it gives you so much. It gives you yeah. encounter tables. It gives you a massive list of names and names from different cultures all around the world. 
So that's always something as a DM and a player. I, I mean, I spent hours and hours with names of characters and places and monsters. Not kidding. Um, and they can be terrible. Like some, some of the names in first edition are not great, but there's many names in fifth edition in the in the content and the adventures that are just like you well, there, couldn't have made been... a, you could have made a more difficult name even <laughs> even the adventure in the starter kit is uh for a town of fandolin uh, you know in my opinion <laughs> that that's not the greatest name for a setting for a settlement is fandolin um, well, especially especially since it's the first one that you're going to encounter. Exactly. I mean, I know that that playing with you, there's been times where you're like going through some of the the modules and 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 we're using some of the the stuff, the encounters and whatnot in in some of the the adventures. Mm -hmm. And I and, and and every so often it'd be like, and then blah 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 blah. Joe Smith, and it's like the name is just atrocious, and it's either just out. You know, it's like you're going into the depths of this thing and then you run into like Barry Manilow. What? Why are we running into Barry Manilow? Or, you know, the, the name will be like, it's, uh, uh, that's a C, that's a K, that, uh, I'll just call him Jim. You know, there's like these complex names that just like throw you outside of the game a bit. So. Yeah, you're, you're a hundred percent right. They're either unpronounceable and you can't believe that anybody, that somebody actually has said this out loud and then decided it was a good idea or their names that are just cheesy and someone's just trying way too hard. Um, so oh, to God, get that yeah. balance, a lot of times I think it helps to lean on real life names or other languages to have some kind of foundation, you know, or at least say the name out loud when you write it down. <laughs> that, that's a good yeah, place to start. When, when I pick names for characters, I I go to like if it's a if it's an elf or if it's a tiefling or if it's a whatever, um, yeah. I actually go online and I will I'll just Google names for you know halflings in mm -hmm. D D. and there's you know a gazillion websites that come back that have their own sort of thoughts about these kinds of things and and there's also like generators you know that you can actually mm -hmm. go in it has a collection of pretty much every name ever you know categorized for that particular you know character type but um even some of them are kind of not pronounceable so yeah you kind of yeah. I think it just takes you out of the game a bit too much. Yeah. But then again, after a while, if you get to know the people you're playing with, if you come up with a name that's completely ludicrous, uh, it doesn't matter because they'll just go hee hee hee, and then everyone will move on. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it but depends, for starters, like, it might you might want to pay more attention. Yeah, it depends on what kind of story you have, I think. Um, but Xanathar's has a lot of useful items for dungeon masters. I'd say that's the best one overall um yeah of the additional books i i use more from the original books from first edition i'd say um especially the second monster manual monster manual 2 that's my yeah. favorite collection of creatures best art i think and it's also got a great cover um one of the most iconic covers in dnd &D, i think but there are some useful things. Uh, I, you know, overall, I'd still think the best thing about fifth edition is how efficient and smooth the rules are. But the actual content, personally, I would lean more back into first edition or classic fantasy. Um, right. But of course, there's, you know, hundreds, of, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people playing this game. So um, there's going to be lots of different kinds of tables. Um, overall. You know, that's that's really your options are the free basic rules, one of the starter kits, or going to the core books. And as you say, after that, you can add more resources. Yeah. The other you're thing right about Xanathar's, I like that one. Yeah. Yeah, I think that one is uh, the best overall. Um, for the game, you're also going to need dice. So there are digital rollers, which makes me, you know, quiver at the thought of it um <laughs> but um if you want to spend about uh in canada seven to twelve bucks actually no canada is more like 10 to 15. the us is about seven to twelve for uh, a dice set you can get a great dice set 
a really popular company that makes usually good quality dice are ChessX. Another company who's made dice for us is Q Workshop, amazing company out of Poland. Yeah, I like them a lot. They're really cool. And there's, you know, there's 10,000 dice companies now. Um, the one thing I would say is quite a few of the dice are not great quality anymore. Um, some of the dice that's come, that have come with some of the sets that are in the game too aren't the best quality. Sometimes that helps you. Like the, the starter set dice, they're blue with white numbers, white lettering. I've never rolled more 20s in my life than with that D20. <laughs> That's actually a concern I have for a lot of the dice companies that you see out there is that they come up with these really creative dice, but I often wonder about where is the center, like where's the point, you know, the center of balance? Like is, is that yeah. somewhere skewed to one side because they, I don't know, put like a, the the ones where they have like little tiny things like rubber ducks or whatever inside of the dice. And you're exactly. like, is it going to be heavier on one side? So yeah. So maybe exactly. So I, <laughs> everyone there, should I pick have... up that dice. Yeah. So I don't use it against you guys. I don't use it against my players very much because it is a deadly D20. Um, there is another set I got from a third party company, a, one of these, you know, many small dice companies that also rolls either high or low all the time consistently like so i would in general i would recommend it from you know one of the bigger you know companies so you know that the dice are actually going to roll properly or you know find a smaller company it's great to support small companies like ours <laughs> yeah, exactly. and find one who they actually have taken the time and they have quality dice because there are for sure it's just there's so many um it's hard to even list all the companies another another dice company out of edmonton ice cream dice um they're they're good too they have some interesting um sort of different themes as shane said you can get dice with ducks in them and you know i've got some dice that have swords on them and you name it you can get any color now um it's not like when we were young and they were just the basic colors <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> yeah the ones um, i think they, they were red and then if you got the i want to say it was the advanced D bo uh, like box uh, mm. i think those ones were i think those ones were blue for some reason like a sort mm. of a darkish blue but um i i wish to this day that i've i i don't i don't know where they are i want to know where my original mm. dice are I know they're in a box somewhere that I have yet to locate, but I, I really want those dice back. But it's just the memories attached to it are, are legion. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, I sold all my stuff from back then when I was a starving student in the late 80s. I was like, I, I, I hadn't played the game for two or three years at least. I'd started university. Well, <laughs> that's a long story. I'm never going to play that game again. And, There's uh, all these hot women that I'm going to be chatting up at university. <laughs> well, I decided eventually to sell all my collection, which was basically everything in first edition and basic and expert, a lot of a lot of books and including the dice and everything. I'm sure the hobby store here had a field day. Um, and uh, yeah, I it would have been nice to have kept that around, but um you know, it was a long time until I came back to the game. There's no way I could have known that I that I was going to come <laughs> back to it. So the other thing you can have, which I still use, is the old DM screen. I actually got a copy of the original one that I used on uh, eBay. So this is the original Advanced Dungeons & Dragons first edition oh, master wow. screen. Uh, it's still in decent shape. And... Um, the funny thing about it is about, I'd say, 40% of the back of the cover are psionic rules. So really? mind powers and Dungeons and Dragons, which very few people use back in the day and very few people still use. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that was an interesting choice that they spent so much of the of the um, screen on that. The, the screen I use, uh, usually use, uh, this one from Dungeons and Dragons, the one thing I'll say about this one for fifth edition is they did the best job of putting what you need on the back of that dungeon master screen. 
It's exactly what you need. It's things like light that you forget about, the rules, uh, how far you can see in the distance, how strong is a door or a window, like if you wanted to break it, and then all the conditions, which, you know, for me, no matter how many times I talk about the conditions, I forget what they all are, you know? Well, I know that I've asked at least once or twice about, uh, yeah, so how strong is a door? If you attack a door or a yeah. wall or the floor. You definitely yeah. have. Here is the best made Dungeon Master screen I've got. And this one is from Cubicle 7, who is a company who makes Warhammer. And this is incredible. It is so well made. It's so sturdy. And it's, it's got a gorgeous beautiful, too. Yeah, a beautiful picture of a medieval uh, town. So that is, yeah, I, I still haven't used that very much. But, uh, and these screens, they're all about, um, about 15 bucks American, about $20 Canadian. So not really pricey. It's a nice way of you hiding all your notes and information from your players. It also is a good way to, um, for everybody to remember there's the dungeon master and they're the players. Now I know there's a movement of people who don't like using the screen. They want to see everybody's faces completely. And it sort of, it symbolizes some kind of authority or I, I don't see it like that at all. I mean, that's one way to play, but to me, again, it's a good place to keep your notes. So you keep things hidden from the players. Um, you can have a lot of in good information on the screen on the back. You can have post-its to do the initiative order and I like the fact that the dungeon master is a separate kind of player in the game than the players. And that's the kind of game that I, you know, that I'm interested in one where it's understood that this is the lead storyteller. This is basically the referee and the players are a different part of the game. And um, that's how the game is organized. And that's how the game yeah. was when it began. And it still is. And um at the same time, you don't have to have a screen and um, you could just keep your notes in front of you. Um, but it's a nice part of the tradition of the game too, in my opinion. When I've played or run a game where it's the using the an actual module, um, I usually have the screen, but I still, I still use my original basic rules screen, you know, the one with the guy opening the door, the DM. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but when I've run other games, it kind of depends on the environment too. Like if you're at a table or if you're in a living mm -hmm. room and if I'm in that, if I've uh, quite often you're in a living room, just hanging out, I've just, you're not even bothered with it. You just kind of hide things you don't want them to know. Uh, but uh, I mean, but that's the thing. The, even the DM's guide at some point on the first few pages actually says, this is just a guide. You don't have to do everything exactly as we say, yeah. because the point of the game is to actually have fun doing it. If you're busy, you know, what is encumbrance? We need to calculate everyone's encumbrance for the next three hours. <laughs> like, what is the point? Yeah, and so, exactly. And that sort of got lost sometimes too about, like we talked last week about, you know, it's a game we're having fun and People can choose to do whatever they want. You're allowed to have different opinions. I know that's not super popular sometimes, but the reality is, is we are, yeah. we're all different. We can have different opinions. And there's, as I said, so many different kinds of tables. Um, that's something we try to do with our books is write books for people who are playing, you know, some sort of thriller game, some people who love combat, some people who like, um, you know, role play and exploration. And, you know, there's lots of lots of ways to play the game. The, the last item for getting ready for D&D, &D, which, you know, maybe is the most important, is definitely snacks. Yes. 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 I mean, yes. you're saying about snacks? Well, I, I think really the players, you know, the players should bring them. I agree, actually, to be honest, because if you're playing a game on a regular basis, there's a lot of effort that goes into actually organizing things like, oh, I don't know, the table. Um, you know, that, yeah, that takes a, what takes you five minutes. Yeah, I'm sure it doesn't take you any time at all. But not to mention, you have to remember what happened last time. You have to sort of refresh your brain. You have to kind of go, okay, where was everybody? Um, mm -hmm. Like you actually take photographs of the table at the end of every session because you're like, in five days, I'm not going to remember exactly where mm -hmm. everyone is, but I'll open up this photo. Oh yeah, yeah, you guys were over here, and the dragon was about to eat you. But there's definitely those kinds of elements that I also think get lost and. Um, 
but yeah, bringing snacks, bringing, uh, you know, snacks that everybody can have, which is actually another challenge for a lot of people. Like in our group, we have a couple of people, there's, you know, lactose intolerance, there's allergies, there's, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, people that have certain diets and stuff. And it can be a challenge uh, for that kind of stuff to happen. And, And to be honest, it's been really so long since we played in the same room. I've almost forgot. What is the most recommended snack to bring to a game? Well, as we talked about, there are many tables. Um, however, I mean, I'm gonna go the I'm gonna go with chips being way up there. Yeah. You know, some people don't like them because then you might mess up your character sheet or you might touch somebody's precious miniature. But you know, as long as you, you know, as long as you look after your hands, uh, snacks are definitely up there. That's the most common snack still at our table, and I think it was when I was playing in the seventies and eighties. Um, the one with me that I wonder about how you don't mess the table up is pizza. Like it's, that's a great snack, but there has to be some kind of uh, juggling process there to, you know, to, to have pizza. Maybe people who are more into their phones and, and uh, iPads than we are. Um, maybe that's not as big of an issue because yeah. With papers, pen and paper, we don't want to get that stuff uh, messed up very much. Um, but pizza would be up there. Oh, popcorn, of course. We we sometimes have popcorn at our table. Um, yeah, for me, probably chips is number one. What about you, Shane? I would have to go with popcorn. Popcorn. Because I, A, it's it's relatively healthy. Uh, compared to, I don't know, jelly beans, for example. Um, Mainly because, and it's also easy to make. It's not something that really costs a whole lot to actually Mm -hmm. generate. I mean, the only thing, the only effort you have to do is you have to remember, oh, if I'm going to get to the game on time in a reasonable amount of time, I need to do it beforehand. Um, So yeah, I mean, there's definitely that. that, uh, And that's actually, I mean, chips are easy because you can just bring the bags and away you go. But for other stuff, um, there's been a couple times where uh, I actually was trying to bring veggie plates to uh, right. to the game, but I was taking the bus and I, you know, didn't do it in time, or you know, something would happen, and uh, and I think I only was successful like once, but um, those kinds of things because I like to make my own hummus and stuff like that, so mm. sometimes bringing that's kind of a nice thing, but um, it does require some prep time, much like putting the table together and setting up everything. Yeah, well, mention, that's why. Yeah, that's why for the dungeon master, it's kind of you know they were already busy doing so many other things. Um, we we've also had what else at our table? We've had uh, definitely lots of bowls of candy people have brought. Yeah, chocolate. We've had cake, of all especially kinds. for celebrations, right? For our for every year we have our group. That group now is six years old. So every year we have a cake usually when we're playing in person, like you said. Yeah. Um, and then we had a cake for our hundredth podcast episode um what else have we had cake we've had probably yeah donuts donuts a couple times there's been uh the i mean candy the candy assortment has been sort of all over the place there's been yeah candy brought from oh i happened to go to this comic-con or this particular thing and i bought some stuff and brought it back to share with everybody and and uh and stuff like that and i mean you're right about the whole idea about when you are eating these foods at the table um you know, I've wrecked many, many a sheet because I touch something like, ah, I suddenly don't know how many hit points I have. Or yeah. uh, the worst, worst case scenario is that you just dump everything everywhere. And uh, that's actually <laughs> yeah. something that I've often wondered about. Uh, you know, maybe it's a good idea to have like a snack table because yeah. you know, you're allowed <laughs> yeah, to get yeah. it for the table, go get yeah. it and bring back something small. Yeah. Because especially with, you know, your table getting more elaborate with all of the different, uh, you know, landscape uh not just the 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 miniatures but all the landscape Mm -hmm. and stuff uh and the buildings um there's really no place to put like oh guys we've got to be move you into this cave over here and there's a big you know bowl of chips right in the way right right (laughs) yeah well again that's why i keep talking about you know we want to have fun with our game but we also want to be practical with what we can do luckily in our new place here we will we we will have room for snacks um Yes, I yeah, really for sure. Wanna... I mean, you look like you said. You're looking on your character sheet. Okay, what do I have in my backpack? Oh, I've got uh, rope. I've got some uh, 
Um, you know, I've got, uh, oh, wait, pizza smudge. Yeah. So, yeah, you want to be, uh, but it's an important part. You know, there's a great, there's a great, um, a great meme that goes that people put around, put up with uh, Keanu Reeves. It was when he was doing a promo for a new video game, I believe. And oh, so he yeah, walks one, out yeah. to this big crowd. And uh, so in the, in the meme, he walks out and it says something like, you know, showing up to the game is great. Showing up to the game on time is really great. But showing up to the game on time with snacks, that's where you want to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah you're breathtaking yeah oh and then the drinks i remember back like again back you know in the 70s and 80s definitely it was like mountain dew and pop all oh, their God, all yeah. different kinds of pop and chips there that it's funny how that's changed because now very very few people that we play with for example uh have pop drinks anymore almost everybody has their water their water bottle right yeah i have been noticing that as as we get older, yes. uh, yeah, the, the sugary drinks and stuff, yeah, when you when you do have them, you know you've had them. Oh, because yeah. like two oh, or, th- yeah. you know, like an hour later, you're like, I'm having heart palpitations. Yeah. Or I'm about to crash and go to and have a nap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's interesting the things that have changed uh, for sure. A lot has not changed very much, but there's a few things there where people definitely being healthier even the idea of having healthy snacks. I mean, that didn't cross my mind right away. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is so yeah. true. Yeah. But uh, overall, I think the best rule that we've talked about tonight about getting into the game and starting out is just to start because ultimately maybe D and D itself is not the game engine for, for somebody they prefer insert, you know, another engine out there, whatever right. it might be, because all you really have trying to do is actually just tell a story and, and yeah. try to experience the story as if you were living it in your own you know life. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the goal, at least for me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. For everyone, sure. it's not complicated. everyone else must calculate the encumbrance. That is so <laughs> important. To hit armor class zero is what? What? <laughs> yeah. Well, the one thing I noticed, which was interesting, was looking again at this old Dungeon Master screen and looking at the rules back then, that every class you had a different to hit table. And so you had to go along every time and find out, okay, what does a thief hit need to hit armor class two? Look down the table. Oh, my God. I don't want to ever have to do that again (laughs) yeah yeah the new rules in my opinion are much much more efficient uh, and um you can get back more into the the story itself and the crunchy stuff just moves along quickly exactly and especially when you have the right tools such as books published by kwood publishing can you tell that we're sponsored? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's one option. That's an option. You know, one, the practical part of that is that it's nice to have creatures that your players don't know. So yeah. you pull out a monster and, uh, for example, the Basilisk. The Basilisk 2 in the Monster Manual core book is not, not really overwhelming. So we created a giant Basilisk. So have fun with that. But yeah, having creatures that your players don't know, uh, I mean, a lot of players too won't take the time to look through the monster manual, but experienced players probably will. And experienced players might have, you know, encountered most of the creatures that are there. So that's one reason we made the books too. So here's some new creatures and characters that you've never seen before. Exactly. Uh, Because I I have one experience about the whole creatures uh, thing where, uh, you brought out what was that creature that had that's like a cougar with like tentacles or a tiger with tentacles? I've forgotten. Oh, what I know what you called. mean the displacer beast. Displacer beast, and yeah. I remember seeing that eons ago and and right. knowing that it existed, but I'd never ever seen it in an adventure. And then you threw it in for one of our our sessions, and I'm like, yeah. I know this. I know I recognize what this looks like. I don't remember what it does, but I remember that creature like like it was an old friend you were kind of meeting on the trail, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great. Eat my face. 
Yeah, exactly. That's a great creature from yeah the original original books, and um, yeah, I think always to as part of those stories you want to change things up and. I try not to have the same creatures over and over. And I try to, there's still a bunch of creatures I still haven't used in our group, for example, um, that I just, it has to make sense. You know, that's for me yeah. in the story. Like if you're, if the party's in the North, they're not going to run into this desert, you know, sand shark creature, for example. Well, like there was that time where we were talking about, uh, I think we were traveling somewhere and you just, and you just sort of offhandedly said, oh, it, 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 the weather's turning, it's kind of rainy and it's kind of gross and you guys aren't feeling, you know, too excited about that. And that's when you threw those invisible, I forgotten what they're called. They're out of one of your books. It was like the invisible things that only came out in the rain or whatever. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. yeah and we were getting attacks man. like, you've been, a, you've been hit. It's like, what by? You, you're not sure. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, ah! <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. I, I enjoyed that a lot. But uh, but we've been going for a little while, so I think we should wrap it up there because uh, we have a third episode to record next week and we're just going to keep going until then. So, Sounds um, good. But thank you all for listening, watching, and sending us all of those wonderful comments You know about how amazing we are. If you haven't, wink, wink, um, please do. Uh, but otherwise... Uh, Thank you for coming by. And it was good to talk to you again, sir. And uh, let's do it again next week. You too. Later. Bye, everybody.